At this time on our agenda, we're going to be uh, hearing from a distinguished panel regarding judging unconscious bias and decision making. This is not an action item. And I welcome our presenters, uh, Justice Lori Zelon, Chair of the Judicial Council Advisory Committee on Providing Access and Fairness. Uh, Judge Theodore Weathers, Chair of the Judicial Council's Governing Committee of the Center for Judicial Education and Research, also Dean of the Whitkin College, and Mr. Michael Roosevelt, Judicial Council Criminal Justice Services and Presenter. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm going to get right to the slide presentation. This is an opportunity to kind of hear um, in a very abbreviated fashion some of what was covered in the closed session. And I wanted to highlight that the important conversation around uh, bias, implicit bias, unconscious bias, is one that is happening across the nation. It is how do we talk about the issues of race uh, in a way that people really get it uh, and breaks through some of the uh, barriers around having these kinds of important conversations. Um, when people talk about race or racism or systematic racism or bias, uh, people can become very defensive. But the research shows us and has demonstrated to us that much of what we're talking about is unconscious bias. We're talking about the types of bias, the type of unconscious bias that exists in the world. And so what we learn is that when we talk about unconscious bias, we really understand that a lot of what's happening to us is not conscious. A lot of what people are experiencing, it's not conscious. And it's important to understand that we're not blaming people. We're saying, let's understand how the brain works. I'm going to go through very quickly some slides that we've had. I'm going to ask you to do a little exercise with me. And I'm going to ask you to count to yourselves the number of times you see the letter F as in fog. F as in fog in that paragraph. Don't read the paragraph. Just count the number of times you see the letter F. How'd you do? So question, how many of you counted uh, three, just only three? Five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 35. No, no, okay, here we go. There were only 12. Um, we all look like the same exact thing, but we see things differently. And our minds take shortcuts. Uh, we make these quick uh, adjustments and shortcuts. And so we skipped over some Fs, right? Um, or in some cases, some people counted too many. Uh, but that's OK. The whole idea is to talk about how quickly the mind takes these shortcuts. This is for people just to remember, just very, very quickly. Again, we make associations and snap judgments. Our brains basically categorize. We take shortcuts. This is a normal process of the human brain. Uh, and it's important to understand that it's indispensable, that the cognitive process, how the brain works, it's important that we kind of categorize things into different clear areas. Very quickly, we identify three things about an individual, as you all know, race, age, and gender. When you look across this room and look at me, I want you to guess my gender, my approximate age, and my race. Um, you're probably going to guess African American, uh, 23 or so <laughs> years of age, I know. Um, and um, these are approximate things you're going to, but we notice these things very, very quickly. Why is that important? Because our brain categorizes. And it does this in such a way that we have favorable or unfavorable impressions of people. Our brain basically does something that's very quickly. It organizes into what we call schemas. I'm going through this very, very quickly. And these schemas also can shape how we look at in-groups and out-groups. Uh, in-groups and out-groups. We all have a strong preference. Uh, and this is normal, again, into social categories in groups and out groups, very, very quickly. We also tend to perceive persons in our own groups 
with uniqueness, but we review our group members as all the same. You know, those people, how they all look. You, we do that generally. This is important for people to understand that this is wired, hardwired in our brains to categorize and to have uniqueness and or particularity. However, our brains are so tricky, they're so tricky that what they tend to do is if we have a belief that we want to maintain, we create a new category so we can keep our beliefs intact about a particular group. So in other words, we kind of change the script, so to speak. So our biases are so strong. We talk about biases and stereotypes like heat-seeking missiles. They are looking for something to hit, the heat. They're looking and they're searching. And so we create a subcategory of a group of people. We create what we call the exception to the rule, that they fall into a different category. Now, true, this is especially true when the outgroup is large and the stereotype is negative. We have implicit biases. And why it's important to talk about implicit biases? Because this is about the unconscious mind. This is about how the mind works. This really focuses us in very directly that this, no matter how smart we are, no matter how brilliant we are, no matter how caring we are, that our biases seep through, not at a conscious level, but at an unconscious level. Here are some quick things that we can do to mediate the, and recognize and also mediate bias. First of all, we have to recognize that we are distracted, we're more likely to be biased. So we can mediate distraction, we reduce our chances of being biased. We can reduce our stress, but acknowledge that stress contributes to our bias, um, we can have an impact on bias. We also recognize that if we're bored, so if we recognize that we are more likely to be biased if we're bored, then we can uh, increase, decrease boredom. In other words, when we do things the same way all the time, it becomes sort of ritual, it becomes sort of, sort of progressively sort of predictable, but if we break it up, try something different, uh, it will perhaps change. I'll give you an example. There was a judge in another state where her calendar was primarily seeing people of color. And she understood that by seeing the same people unconsciously, she was coming to conclusions about that group. She recognized that. And so she asked her judge to put her in a county where most of the offenders looked like her, who were white. Because she was attempting to say, I'm, I am, no, my brain is working on this information. I want to shift my brain. I'm making a conscious decision to take on a different calendar in a different location that counter the stereotype. Do you follow what I'm saying? So it's really important to address boredom. Time pressure. If you're under pressure, you're more likely to be biased. These biases are stronger when you are under time pressure. Absence of accountability. If somebody's watching you, you're less likely to be biased. I know that in California, we had mentor judging program, mentor judges, uh, the senior judges work with less experienced judges. Uh, those are ways in which you can have somebody who's sort of accounting. I'm not talking about the CJP as accountability. I'm talking about colleagues and others who can uh, provide a certain level of accountability. The lack of motivation to be accurate or fair also plays into if you don't have the interest or willingness to be fair and accurate, then you're more likely and more prone to be biased. But these are just some simple highlights. So what? Very quickly, HP computers. If you know about HP computers, they're wonderful computers. I have one at home. They're really great. A few years ago, they actually did a wonderful thing. They put a, created a new camera, and that camera could follow you around the room. So if you're moving like I'm moving right now, and you were at home, that, it, that camera would kind of move with you. But here was the problem. Someone discovered something very interesting about the HP camera. It would not follow black faces. So they would, the camera would just stay frozen. They said, well, what, what, is the camera broken? Well, what they discovered is that the people who created the camera only use one race in order to, what, identify faces. And so therefore, like a jury, like any workplace, 
If you don't have a diversity of viewpoints, then biases enter into it. And so this is what HP's explanation was. I found it interesting. Just, you can just read it. I love that. Has difficulty seeing contrast in conditions where there is insufficient foreground light. They mean dark faces. OK, you get, you get it? And so that was there. And so the idea is that even people who have the best intentions, uh, who are scientists and who have studied it, their biases also come into play. Important technology. This is one that I think is important because it highlights a little uh, in Florida. And this is very quickly, for those of you who've seen this before, but it's important. In Florida, this is what they were using in one part of Florida for target practice. This was in 2005, last year, 2015, last year. This is what was used for target practice. OK, so how did they discover this was being used? Well, when they were going through their post training, the officers would go in there, they would uh, practice shooting, and then they would leave. But another group came in, um, and the woman who was in the, coast, in the National Guard, she came in and saw, that's my brother up there. What, what is he doing up there? And immediately they were shocked and said, we're going to change it immediately. We're going to take this down. But you did not change the unconscious. You didn't change the brain, how the brain had been primed to see these faces as more dangerous. And so I highlight that because understanding how bias can play into um, our decision making, this is an obvious point where probably good people who were thinking about training their officers didn't think about the impact of this particular way. Then this most recent study, and it's been replicated over and over about police shootings and police involved shootings uh, and police involved uh, in, their, in their duties where they see a person, this is an ambiguous test, the person uh, is a video and the person has a, mm, may have a cell phone, may have a gun, may have a beer bottle, uh, and he's African American. White, cell phone, beer bottle, you know, same objects, same positions, et cetera. And what they show, the officers shoot more quickly the African American than they shoot the white person with the same object. It's very, very, more quickly, a split second decision, and oftentimes it may be based on how you're trained, right? So you make that association and you have a quick response. And so the shoot, no shoot has been replicated, and a lot of police departments across the country are using this in their training. San Francisco Police Department is one, but also district attorneys and public defenders. <laughs> Again, minimizing. It's important, if we want to minimize implicit bias, is to really wait until all facts are in. That seems very obvious. But when you're rushing, when you're bored, um, when other things are happening, that decreases. Even people with few biases, this is important, must remind themselves that it's an ongoing process to minimize their effect. This is California as of 2010, and it highlights who is in our prison. So we follow the trajectory. When we make decisions about things, there are real so what consequences. So we look at the percentage of population uh, or the number of the population, and you can see that African Americans and Hispanics uh, are in prison at disproportionate rates of the representation in the general population. These are starting statistics, but they highlight the work that must be done to address institutional bias and work that has to be done to address implicit bias. With that, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that presentation, Mr. Roosevelt. Thank you, Michael. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm here on behalf of the uh, Seizure Governing Committee, and I wanted to uh, discuss with you some of the uh, programs that we have, we currently offer uh, in this area and also are planning to uh, work on for the future. Um, each of you has in your materials a list of uh, programs uh, that Seizure has developed on the topic of implicit bias. This topic is covered in many of uh, our key programs, um, and we uh, provide this information through virtually every delivery method, including in-person programs, 
uh, distance education and in our print uh, programs. Um, of course, our premier programs, the new judge orientation, the uh, judicial college, and the qualifying ethics program touch uh, virtually all of our judicial officers, including judges, commissioners, referees, and appellate justices. Uh, and the distance education items and the judicial handbooks are also available 24-7 uh, at CJUR online. I actually am uh, next door in uh, the Sequoia room teaching new judge orientation to a group of 13 new judicial officers this week, along with three other very experienced um, and highly accomplished faculty members, uh, Judge uh, Tony Moore from Los Angeles, Judge Patricia Lucas from Santa Clara, and Commissioner Catherine Lyons from the San Francisco Court. Um, and included in the new judge orientation program, I would mention that this NJO program was completely redesigned two years ago uh, with uh, the help of Judge David Rothman and a work group uh, uh, that was comprised of other judges. Um, and uh, the attempt was to integrate this area of implicit bias uh, education into throughout the new judge orientation program. Um, the NJO program is, was redesigned and is now structured around Judge Rothman's central principle of being a judge and the related eight pillars. And that's something that we discussed not only in NJO, but at the Judicial College. And once again, in the, well, we did it in the Qualifying Ethics 5 uh, program. QE6 is just about ready to roll out. Um, and I think next week we have training programs for uh, judicial officers to teach the QE6 program. So we're looking forward to, to that. Um, Judge Rothman's uh, central principle is to, uh, is re referencing the independent, impartial, and honorable judiciary is to maintain the utmost integrity in decision making. And what it means is that judges need to be aware of their own biases and maintain a high degree of self-awareness. Um, this week-long NJO course devotes a significant amount of time to issues such as social cognition research as it relates to implicit or unconscious bias. We also uh, have the students, the student judges, uh, take the Harvard Online Implicit Association Test, which measures attitudes and beliefs that individuals may be unwilling or unable to report because there is an implicit attitude that you're not aware of uh, consciously. So um, that is well incorporated in our new uh, judge education program. The uh, CJUR Governing Committee is currently in the process of crafting the education uh, program for the 2016-2018 uh, two-year plan year. And we plan to submit that uh, two-year plan to the Judicial Council in June for consideration and approval. As part of the process, the uh, CJUR's Judicial Branch Access, Ethics, and Fairness Curriculum Committee has submitted to CJUR's Governing Committee a recommendation to include courses on unconscious bias in this education plan, uh, which would be part of all of our statewide judicial, attorney, judicial and attorney institutes, including the PJCEO Institute, the Supervising Judges Institute, Appellate Judicial Attorney Institute, Appellate Justices Institute, Cow County Judges Institute, Crim Law, Civil Law, Probate Law, Juvenile Law, Family Law Institutes, and also the Trial Attorney Institute. The um, Access, Ethics, and Fairness Curriculum Committee has also recommended that courses be offered regionally and locally upon request. Once this course is developed, we would cover many topics, including imperial, empirical evidence and neuroscience, the role of stereotypes, factors that make it more or less likely to act on unconscious bias, and of course, remedies uh, to deal with unconscious bias. Uh, as you can see, this subject was extremely important to the Access, <coughs> Ethics, and Fairness Curriculum Committee. And the committee wanted to ensure that this topic was incorporated uh, as effectively and deeply uh, as it could possibly be throughout all of our curriculum. Uh, the committee has also recommended that a bench card on the subject of unconscious bias also be developed. Uh, currently, bias education is woven throughout all of our education programs for judges and court staff. 
Um, that's not to say that uh, uh, we are perfect, far from it. Um, we're always uh, looking for recommendations uh, in this area. And um, uh, we, have, we just want to express our commitment, our expanded commitment to uh, this uh, critical area of education. With that, I'll turn it over to Justice Zelon. Thank you, Judge Weathers. Thank you. Um, I am here today uh, as <clears throat> the co-chair, along with uh, Justice O'Leary, of the uh, Advisory Committee on Providing Access and Fairness. The, the discussion that you've had today and the, the work on implicit bias sits um, within a larger framework. And the larger framework, of course, starts with goal one, because access, fairness, and diversity is goal one of, uh, of our strategic plan, and it guides our branch. We live in an increasingly diverse state with court users which come, who come uh, with a variety of abilities and needs and from a variety of backgrounds. What we all look for is fairness, um, to provide meaningful access to everyone. Uh, we want to be fair and we want to make sure that we appear fair because procedural fairness is important to our users uh, as well. So the council, of course, and all of its advisory bodies are responsible for policies that improve uh, access and fairness. Um, but we serve in a way as a subject matter expert for uh, the council and the other committees uh, on these issues, and we are very proud to do so. We've been charged by you with making recommendations to improve access, to improve fairness, to recognize diversity and improve diversity in the branch, and to improve services for those uh, litigants who come to us without counsel uh, because of economic issues. Um, and we are working with the other advisory groups on the intersection of all of these issues um, because they come up in main, many subject matter areas. Um, this committee stands on the shoulders of the prior advisory committee on access and fairness. And some of what I want to talk about for a minute is the history of what has been done because we have a long tradition of trying to address these issues in a variety of ways. So much of what I'm going to talk about in the next minute or so really has to do with work that has been done in prior years. And then I'm going to tell you what it is that your current committee is doing now. Um, the goal has always been twofold, to continue the conversation so that people can address the issues of bias that come uh, and the importance of procedural fairness, and to provide tools to the courts at all levels to assist them in providing justice that not only is fair but looks fair. Um, and so some of the projects that have been done was a publication on gender bias guidelines for judicial officers, uh, collaboration uh, with uh, the Human Resources Division and CJUR in providing employment discrimination training for court personnel who are involved in employment decisions. <laughs> Um, hosting a regional conference in 2008 of women of color in, uh, in the courts uh, with the intersection of gender and um, race issues was a very important issue and continues to be an issue. Uh, we helped produce an educational video, video called Summary Judgments, which did not have to do with um, procedural summary judgment, but had to do with the kind of summary judgments that we all make um, that addressed sexual orientation, racial, ethnic, and gender fairness. And we worked with CJUR in developing a curriculum to use that video. We've had educational roundtables to talk about cultural awareness and Native American issues in the court, and in 2003, we finalized a resource guide for bench officers uh, on Native American issues, and uh, I am going to suggest that we go back and work with the tribal and state court forum to update that uh, useful tool for bench officers. Um, we've talked about in improving interactions between court users and court security, which is an area where there can be great difficulty. Um, we worked with the bar um, on uh, summits on achieving diversity in the judiciary in 2006 and 2011. And late last year, the council approved some recommendations that uh, the committee made to you concerning implementing some of the findings that came out of those diversity summits. Um, 
More recently, the uh, trial court presiding judge advisory committee was looking at its publication on making judicial assignments, and they reached out to us, and we were able to provide information to them to assist presiding judges in undertaking efforts to uh, address procedural fairness and perceived bias uh, in assignments of judges, and um, we were very pleased to do that. We've also uh, offered training on a regular basis to the Jenny Commission on uh, bias and fairness. And um, a number of years ago brought to the council and had approved an access protocol which requires every committee in adopting policy to consider its impact on access. Uh, we hope to come back to you later this year with some new recommendations on expanding the use of that protocol and the utility in light of new findings. So. Um, the one item that you have in front of you from us is the diversity toolkit. Um, we just finished that. That was based on some work that was done over um, three years between 2011 and 2013. They were focus groups with court users, with members of the bar, with court personnel, and we wanted to discuss with them some emergent and persisting issues affecting women and women of color in the courts. Um, during those um, focus groups, a number of us were very surprised because issues that we thought were done were not done. People brought to us continuing issues um, that concerned them, and this was across the court community and across the bar community. So a working group of our members uh, reviewed the data we had been giving uh, to the people who participated in the focus group, promises of anonymity, and so we worked with the data in a way that would preserve the confidentiality um, of the people who had spoken to us and identified key areas where we thought um, improvement still was needed. Much of the work revolved around issues of unconscious bias, the things that we have just been discussing, and cultural sensitivity. And so we uh, determined that uh, it would be helpful to develop a tool for courts to use to begin to identify areas where they could take action to address unconscious bias, to educate court personnel and judges, and to work with that. And the toolkit that is in your material uh, was the tool that was developed for local courts to use. Um, it is not mandatory. Um, we hope it is helpful, and we hope that as courts begin to use that, they'll give feedback back to us that will allow us to continue to improve that and to make it an even more helpful tool for courts as they go forward. Uh, we shared it with the uh, PJs and CEOs um, at a meeting, and uh, they uh, were very welcoming to the presentation, uh, asked for no changes, and uh, so the toolkit will now be available to all courts on the network. As we go forward and present to you our annual agenda for next year, which we hope you will approve, um, we uh, are going to plan to work with CJR to improve and expand educational resources uh, on implicit and unconscious bias. We are going to um, make a recommendation to expand information in the bench guide for uh, judicial officers handling cases involving self-represented litigants to more specifically address the issues of unconscious bias uh, that arise there. And I'm thinking about the slide that Michael showed you that talked about stress and time constraints and other issues that um, particularly affect bench officers with calendars like family law with large numbers of self-represented litigants. Um, and that is a more stressful situation. Um, and so we want to provide additional tools uh, for that. Um, we are happy and stand ready to work with every advisory committee and with the council itself uh, on these issues uh, as we go forward. Kiana Williams, who is our lead staff, has expertise in the area of implicit bias and has done training and continues to do training in that area. Um, some of our members also have worked on implicit bias education um, in their local courts or in the state bar, and we are looking forward to collaborating with others to see how we can provide tools to the courts that will help them in these very important issues. Thank you, Justice Elon. I wanted to open it up to comments, but I wanted to start by saying I am 
I'm grateful for the work that's been done in this judiciary for many years that have really laid the grounds for preparing these kinds of toolkits and raising the awareness. Um, I want to say that um, the issue that we confront today has been around for some period of time. and But recently, after the Ferguson U.S. DOJ report, I was asked to serve on an advisory board, a national board, to look at community engagement that focuses on uh, certain groups of folks who feel marginalized, who are marginalized and disenfranchised, and that one of the purposes of the advisory board is to provide tools and resources for court leaders. And what you've described really shows that California for a long time has been at the forefront of these kinds of tools and programs. And specifically, one of the recommendations of the National Advisory Board is implicit bias education and training. Earlier today, as you may know, Michael gave all of us here at Judicial Council uh, a, 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 a presentation that quizzed us and made us think about what we think and how we think. And so to hear Judge Weathers talk about all of this training available to the courts, to our judges, for our decision making to enhance public trust and confidence in the judiciary to ensure equal access, this is important and timely work. And I know that the Advisory Committee on Providing Access and Fairness has had several names, but has always been the focus of confronting bias and ensuring that the primary goal of the Judicial Council, which is as you stated, is access, fairness, and diversity, is always at the forefront of what we do. I thank you for your work. I look forward to going online and seeing some of the resources. I'm gratified to know that this is going to be taught at all levels, at the Appellate Justice Institute as well, uh, which we all attend, and uh, the college, new judges orientation, and interwoven in all the education that's required of the judges. Thank you very much. I open this up to comments or observations or questions. I just want to commend all of you, and especially Justice Elon and K.O. O'Leary for all that you do. Thank you very much. It uh, is a great service to all of us. So thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Okay. That is the conclusion of today's agenda items. As you know, we will meet again tomorrow morning, Friday, April uh, 26th at 8.30 to conduct uh, our business related to the remaining items on our agenda. We stand in recess until that time. Thank you.